Kenda, I'm grateful for you and your life's work. In my own ministry journey and my falling in love with serving young people, your writings spoke to me with words and imagery that resonated with my soul and often just in the nick of time. Uh, I've seen you in formal lectures like these. I have personally witnessed you welcome my youth ministry team unselfishly giving of your time, attention, and encouragement. I've helped you navigate your schedule from a previous event where you valued remaining true to preaching to your local church uh, more than staying at a cool conference, no matter how much I tried to bribe you. Uh, and to me, your vocation and life blur. Your academics and your love for students are indistinguishable. Your commitment to the harmony of theological integrity and beautiful prose is your gift. You've embodied so much of what you've shared with us, and I'm grateful to be inspired by you. And as I've reflected on your lectures in this particular, uh, today, this particular lecture, I want to join you in asking this question that you propose. You say, just how much of what we've learned to call church are we willing to let go in order to follow Jesus? And so let me start with a few preliminary thoughts on this question. Let's not let this uh, question fall into the wrong hands. There are pragmatists out there who think church is mathematical. If church doesn't add up, shut it down, bankrupt it, walk away, let it die. This historical naivete or forced amnesia only sets ourselves up to repeat our sins, replacing one formula with another, with another, one technology for another, one personality with another. And young people are about as interested with pragmatists as they are with grandparents using Facebook. It's be at best, it's cute. Now, let's also not consider that this question, let's not it fall into the wrong evaluation. There are traditionalists who somehow think the church is magical, and you'll notice uh, the Virgin Mary with the unicorn there. Um, if they can just uh, get to church, then young people's lives will magically be changed. And so traditionalists keep counting attendance and wringing their hands of nuns and duns, but their metrics are out of focus. Nancy Tatum Ammerman uh, in insightfully said that we do not find religion today in the predictable places and the predictable forms as we did before. We cannot assume that it's disappearing. And more recently, Emma Green in The Atlantic writes this. She says, the experience of those who are losing religion shouldn't obscure those who are finding it. Traditionalists obsessed with young people religious attendance are unable to see their spiritual participation. And let's not let this uh, question get outsourced. Somehow culture is given way uh, too much credit for the demise of the church. This leads to many leaders looking for someone to take the fall. Protest Postmodernism, Republicans, Democrats, science, the new atheists, and worst of them all, millennials. <laughs> Kendra's question is one of faithfulness where following Jesus will cost the existing church, especially the Western church, something. At the Fuller Youth Institute, we are trying to ask important questions about ministry innovation for and with young people. We have realized that the temptation of many religious leaders is to, fault, to, to default to past successes. We are tempted to spend our time working on best practices, improving quality, leveraging tried and tested approaches, making something good better. And there's a place for that but it has its limitations. What youth ministry and ministry with emerging adults risk requires now more than ever is not best practices, but first practices. These are the spaces we have yet to travel, the spaces we have missed or avoided. There's the spaces where young people need the most support and the church has been the least present. Thus, where young people need the church the most is not a marketing question. It is, as Kenda has rightly put, a love question. In this vein, I wonder if an entrepreneurial vision for the church requires two things that I have only time to gingerly introduce. An entrepreneurial vision needs an entrepreneurial hermeneutic. An entrepreneurial hermeneutic can give us a renewed perspective and language for a way forward together. Let's evoke a hermeneutic that calls us back to the best reasons our local churches and theological students schools started in the first place. Let's appeal to the better nature of our traditions that make us take risks, dream, trust each other, be resources to our community. Let's reclaim gospel as bridge, not barrier, portal, not policy. 
For instance, how might we reinterpret the term uh, leader? Uh, in our book, Growing Young, we found that key chain leadership was one of the characteristics young people appreciated about their churches. Now, well-meaning leaders desiring to promote young people to leadership positions within the church have misunderstood this concept, thinking that if they can give the leadership keys to young leaders, they will keep driving or leading the church just like they did. The fact is, however, that keychain leadership isn't giving young leaders keys to drive, say, the SUV. It's giving them keys to drive the SUV to the dealer to sell it so the proceeds they use can buy 50 bikes, which is better for the environment and serves more people. <laughs> and this is where we see the challenge. Young people don't want to lead an outdated form of church that worked for another generation. They aspire to be like those that have gone before them, to be the church for today's people and today's questions and today's uh, uh, search for good news. So churches are faced with a choice. Give them the keys to the SUV for 50 bikes or keep the SUV and promise them they can ride shotgun and be in charge of the music. To the latter, millennials will answer, thanks, we'll walk. An entrepreneurial vision also needs an entrepreneurial pedagogy. It has become increasingly evident that many young people who have attend youth group are prepared to engage in more youth group after high school, not life. As an educator, I have failed my students if I've curtailed their curiosity, made them afraid to explore, shame them into behaviors, or caricature others who are not like us. If I've steered them away from the hard questions that are even scary for me, I've not done my job. I failed if my students pass their assignments but cannot transfer course ideas into real life contexts. An entrepreneurial vision emphasizes a process, an entrepreneurial pedagogy that calls the church to shift its formational practices from passivity to agency and from control to curiosity. Now, from passivity to agency. In my own research, I discovered that many college students who struggled the most with their spiritual journeys felt paralyzed to be agents of their own faith. They worried about stepping away from the script they were taught and they had no other personal resources to guide them. This led them to try to work out their spiritual questions with friends or by themselves, rarely assessing, accessing churches. An entrepreneurial pedagogy of agency will require something different of youth workers. They will have the beautiful, terrifying responsibility of stepping closer to young people to acknowledge their stories before judging them and, dare we say, welcome their stories as their community's own. Youth group will need to engage, not avoid topics young people want to talk about. It will need a place that is no longer safe for youth workers, but home for young people. In theological institutions, I believe we also need an entrepreneurial uh, pedagogy to train the leaders who will advocate for the young people by encouraging their own agency. Can we reclaim the syllabus as a musical score that invites students to sing their part to make this piece come alive rather, rather than a megaphone with mega information that yells at the student? Can we create class time environments where we belay on with each other online or in the classroom? as the only way to journey forward rather than a class that is a competitive Jeopardy game show? Can we redeem a grading system where the goal is to help students find their voices rather than silence them? An entrepreneurial pedagogy actualizes a vision where young people are encouraged to be agents of their faith journeys, challenging everyone's passivity. Now from control to curiosity. The questions and solutions young people naturally evoke to pursue meaning making need environments where their creativity is encouraged. Researchers such as Kashian and others suggest that people's curiosity prompts intentional, uh, intentionally proactive behaviors in response to novelty, complexity, uncertainty, or conflict. Curiosity equips people to be situationally, relationally, and vocationally more agile, and curious people show signs of experiencing higher levels of well-being. This, of course, will require something different of youth workers, admitting that we have lost our ability to be curious ourselves. According to research, I suggest two reasons for this. First, we're afraid, and second, we're afraid. <laughs> we're afraid, firstly, because topics young people may want to explore will contaminate our reputations. Beck, who researched the psychology of disgust, calls it a boundary psychology where it is a human inclination to keep impure things distanced to maintain purity. 
We see this with youth ministries who aptly define what they are not and get anxious when young people's curiosities blur the lines. This may be why the slippery slope is often uh, evoked. Boundaries that, uh, that control feel safer than curiosity that contaminates. The second fear is that youth workers fear over their own faith formation. Some research suggests that the relational nature of faith creates a contagiousness where the questions and struggles of one person evoke questioning and struggling in others. We can imagine what this looks like when a frantic parent calls a youth worker fretting over their child's faith, and we all well know that the phone call has nothing to do with the child's faith and has everything to do with the parent. Youth workers are just as entrenched as they frame loss, fear, hope, pain, forgiveness, change, or salvation as an abstraction protecting themselves from the life and death topics that really matter to young people. An entrepreneurial pedagogy creates an ecosystem that is safe for young people while necessarily risky for adults. And so the entrepreneurial vision needs an entrepreneurial hermeneutic and an entrepreneurial pedagogy, and time will not allow me then to, to say that there's also a need for a reimagined entrepreneurial metric. How will we measure pro progress? For now, I say that Kenda is offering nothing short of revamping every job description we have as professor, pastor, youth pastor, and congregant. This view asks something of us, which is why Kenda's question is so challenging. How much are we, you and me, willing to let go to follow Jesus for the sake of young people following Jesus? This is a question I fear youth ministry is too quick to support but unprepared to answer. But I'm hopeful that conversations like these will activate a vision that is fueled by an entrepreneurial hermeneutic and pedagogy that is faithful, faithful to the gospel and faithful to the people that we love. Thank you. <laughs>